All right, awesome, exactly four o'clock. So thanks very much for being here. Uh, I'm gonna be doing an introduction to OpenShift, talk a little bit about what it is, what runs underneath some of the technologies. It's just going to be like a few slides, possibly five slides max, because I'm sure you guys are interested in actually seeing the product. Um, for, you, for those of you that are doing the workshop now, very happy to have you here. Feel free to continue doing your workshop or, or, uh, or watch the presentation. It's all going to be recorded for, for later use anyway. Uh, thanks, thanks very much. So if for those of you that are using the OpenShift right now, these are the layers that uh, make the platform, right? So the first layer that we have, it's an operating system layer. So um, OpenShift runs anywhere uh, Linux runs, so anywhere Red Hat Enterprise Linux or CentOS runs, and that is the first layer that, ex that exists. That's where your containers are running. So everything that you do in OpenShift runs inside a container, right? You don't have to necessarily create the container yourself. Sometimes you don't even know the things that are running containers because the platform does it for you, right? So in uh, OpenShift, we have uh, two options to run your containers. The first option is an atomic host, which is a very lightweight operating system. It's about 200 megs on disk. Uh, to run your containers, or so very lightweight operating system to run just containers. The other option is the traditional Red Hat Enterprise Linux that you all know and love. Uh, and the layer on top of that is the container runtime layer. So the container runtime layer orchestrates and negotiates with the operating system kernel the isolation of your process. Remember that containers are an isolated process. So you isolate yourself from other processes. You are isolated There's also from uh, from, uh, from things that might harm you. So uh, your process does not, uh, cannot be accessed by other processes in the same operating system. So that's, a, that's a, let's say the basic explanation of containers. It's a process that's isolated from others. So that means that you can have your own share of memory, your own share of, uh, of uh, compute capacity, CPU, uh, and um, it's secure. It, it uses SE Linux to secure so that uh, the process that you're running or the memory space won't be invaded by other processes. The second layer that's on top of the, the layer, it's the container orchestration and cluster management layer. Um, and this is where uh, the technology that we use for this is Kubernetes. I'm sure you've all heard of Kubernetes, the most uh, popular technology out there uh, today. And uh, the objective of Kubernetes is to orchestrate across multiple nodes uh, and multiple containers, right? Uh, we've seen that if you're running like a single container in your machine, or let's say a 10 containers in a production environment, you probably do not need Kubernetes because uh, it's, uh, your environment is likely not, uh, uh, does not justify uh, installing a container orchestration. The same way that if you have virtualization just for one virtual machine or five virtual machines, you probably don't need VMware or Red Hat Enterprise virtualization. You'll be fine, I guess, with VirtualBox. But once you get to an enterprise environment where more regulated and you are deploying hundreds or thousands of applications across thousands of nodes in different data centers with different uh, security groups and people that control the process, you need a more capable container and cluster management solution that would allow you to tell who can do what at what point if you're deploying an application that needs uh, that it's under a regulated environment, for example, a PCI regulated environment, you make sure you want to, uh, you want to make sure applications land on specific nodes that are regulated and such. And the technology that does this in OpenShift is Kubernetes, right? So it controls networking, storage, uh, it includes the container registry, includes uh, logging and metrics as well. And security is a cross-cutting concern, cross concern on the platform, right? So we see security from the moment you run your, your, uh, your container process to the moment you have, let's say, it exposed to the outside via, for example, so something like as an API management solution. So this is all about running containers. And if we go a level up, we see about, we get into the use cases of building containers and automating the, the, the deployment of containers and also a catalog where I can pick base image and base content from my containers, right? Uh, you can always build your containers yourself and build, b bring in a container to OpenShift which is one of the use cases that you see on the workshop. But most of the people we interact with, they already have a build process um, where they build WAR files, they build JAR files, and they want to have a container image created for that process. So in OpenShift, we have a few technologies that help you uh, create this container for you. So as I said, you as a developer don't need to create the container image yourself. The platform does it for you. And we have learned that transferring the responsibility of container creation to platform allows you to add more governance, right? Uh, it, it, we don't believe to be a recommended solution to have the container that the developer builds on his own machine to be taken to a production environment. So we prefer having a central place where we apply governance on the, 
uh, on the building of containers. So this is it. So this is the, the three layers that we have on OpenShift. And I'm going to now get into the product and talk to you a little bit about this. So my session is going to take, I think, at max 15 minutes more. Uh, so the first thing that you see when you, get, when you enter an OpenShift cluster, and uh, as you can see here, the version of OpenShift that I'm running is OpenShift Online, right? So that means that this OpenShift Online is deployed on a cloud provider. In this case, this is running on AWS, uh, but it could be running on any cloud provider, right? Uh, but the version of OpenShift that we install, or oh, that's running on OpenShift Online, is the exact same version that you can install in your own laptop, that our customers install in their data centers, that our uh, partners install to run. So it's the exact same version. It's the exact same bits. So the, and we are running an online uh, environment with uh, the exact same bits that you get to install on your all environment. So this is Red Hat telling that what do you run for you, we run it for ourselves. So it's something that you can trust. Uh, so the first thing that you see in OpenShift is that uh, you need a place to run your applications, right? And this, for us, is seen as a project. So you're, uh, you're asked to create a project. And my project is going to be called, uh, it's going to be called ALX project, just because I like ALX. Uh, so the, this is my project. I'm just going to give it a project name. And what the project is, is an isolated area from a compute, from a compute capacity perspective also from a network perspective and from a roles and capabilities perspective from other groups. So a project, is like, it's like your, your execution space. And we see customers and, uh, and partners using projects to represent things like different environments. For example, they have a project that represents a production environment and another project that represents a development environment or a staging environment. We see companies that use projects uh, that give projects to their developers so they'd have an area they can play the developer application with. But it have to be, you have to have in mind that essentially it's a quota bound and resource controlled area that you can run things, right? So I'm just going to start with a very basic example. I'm going to run an Node.js application here because uh, I like Node.js, right? Uh, I'm going to select the version of Node.js. And there are essentially three ways you can bring content into OpenShift. One first way is that you give us your Git repo. Like in this case, you can give us a Git repo. And it's, uh, in this case, it has to be a publicly accessible repo because I'm on the internet. But if it's running on your environment, it just needs to be any Git repo that the cluster has access to. So if it's in your company, a Git repo that the cluster has access to in your company. So this is one of the ways. The other way is that if you have a WAR file, or if you have a binary that you want to bring, for example, you have uh, Jenkins to build your WAR files in your reader files, and you want to bring that WAR file to, to OpenShift, so then you can uh, embed that WAR file to an, into a container, like a Tomcat container or a JBoss CAP container. We've seen customers running, for example, WebSphere containers. So this is the second way, bring in a WAR file. And the third way, it is essentially bring your own container image. So if you have developed your container image uh, uh, some other place, you can bring that image to OpenShift. And those of you that are doing the workshop, I think one of the examples that you did, so you're going to a container registry, and you're getting, getting the, the container image and running that on OpenShift. So for the sake of this example here, I'm going to uh, uh, use a Git repository and bring a, um, and create an application based on a Git repo that is publicly accessible. And this is going to be a JavaScript application, right? So it's going to be my JS app. That's the name of my application. The objective of the OpenShift platform is this to automate every single step from code to production, right? So I can uh, click Create here. But if I see the advanced options, it gives me more options as to where I want to bring the content from a Git repo. But it also asks very nice things. For example, like, would you like a route for your application to be created, right? And a route means a externally accessible way to access your application. Another question that he asks is, of course, support, if you'd like to secure that route. And since we're going to actually build the container image, it has options that deal with the build configuration. So as I mentioned in the slides, one thing is running containers, but we've learned that in enterprise environments, you're going to be building containers all the time. So we, all ha we also have facilities to make the to make building containers very approachable to developers, uh, to DevOps groups, or to any user. Once you have built a container, you can also have the options to configure and specify how you want to run things. So for the sake of this example, I'm just going to keep the defaults that I have here, and I'm going to create my application. right? 
So it says that's creating my application, and I'm going to go back to my project. And what's doing right now is that it's going to get the, the source code that it's in a public Git repo. It's going to clone that source code. Uh, in this case, it's a Node.js application, so it's going to get all the dependencies for that source code, package that uh, Node.js application inside a container image. So this is building a container image for you, a Docker image for you. You don't have to do that yourself. If you want to do that, if you'd like to do that, if it's part of your company policies to build container images, great. Just bring your container image to the platform. But in OpenShift, you don't have to do it. We build the container image for you. And as I said, we've learned that once you have a centralized place to build all your container images, the same way you have a place to build your jar files, your war files, you can add more governance. You can add more control. You can add more checks to that process. So in this example here, uh, we're building the, the container image. So what happened is that it identified it was a Node.js application. It read the Node.js modules that I needed to be running. Uh, it executed a package command to get the Node.js modules. And then it started to push this, created an image for you. And then it started to push this image for you into a container registry, right? So at this moment, my image is already in a container registry that can be used by anyone. If I come back to the overview, I will see that my application is very likely running. So yes, here it is. My application is already running. So a lot of things happen here. You went to a Git repo, cloned the Git repo, uh, downloaded the dependencies, packaged the application, added it to a container image, pushed the image to a registry, pulled the image to a registry, found a node to run my application, created a route, and run the application. I think this process took about, let's say, 1 minute and 30 seconds, I would say. And we've learned, uh, some of the, the companies that we interact with, that simple things as having a route created for your application, a DNS addressable route, takes times like, let's say, I need to open a ticket to have a DNS addressable route, and that is going to take like 15 days. We believe that things that can be automated should be automated, and we do this on OpenShift. So this is, as I said, is a very simple application. There's nothing much here, right? It's an OJS application. Here is my application running, right? Uh, I can go to the Git repo and see that it is here. And in this screen, you see some interesting things, right? You see a, a number, a circle, and a pod, and an arrow up, right? Um, with this, it kind of gives you an idea that I can click the arrow and things will happen, right? And that's exactly it. So today, for this application, you have one container running for this application, right? And if you want to scale this, this application to, let's say, two containers, it's just as easy as clicking the arrow up, right? So that means that you have now two containers running these applications. That the my route, because I have a load balancer, was already updated with the address of the two containers to run my application. So I didn't have to do anything other than click the arrow up. I'm sure all of you are saying or, or asking the question, uh, but uh, I did have to click the arrow up. Can I have auto scaling for my applications? Yes, I'm going to show you auto scaling real quick, real quick because we all love this. So first thing that we have to do to configure auto-scaling for the application is actually set some limits for my application because I need to know based on what I'm going to scale things, right? So for this application, that is a Node.js application, I'm going to set the resource limits. And this is, I'm telling the application how much memory and CPU the application can consume, right? And if you remember from the, let's say, virtual machine days, the least amount of compute power you could give to your application, it's one vCPU, right? On OpenShift, you can have actually millicore. So you get one core divided by a thousand, and you can have this level of granularity for this application. So I'm just I'm going to do here on, an, uh, on a CPU level. So I'm going to say that this application is going to use 255 megs of RAM, and the CPU is going to be calculated for this application, right? So I'm going to save this. And now something very nice is happening, right? Now, this is something that people love. This is something called rolling deployments, right? So that means that you're going to bring a new deployment of the application while the other deployment is running, right? And the reason I need a new deployment is that we believe in uh, immutable configuration for applications. So I didn't go to a running container and change the specification, right? I actually created a new container with new resource limits, and I did that in a rolling deployment fashion. So I brought a new container up, added to the router, and then I took one down, added the second up, added to the router, and then I took the third one down. So with this, your service level wasn't disrupted because I always had applications responding on my route. Right? So as you can see, now I have, and now that I have actually resources, I can go to my applications deployments, and I can see here, for this specific deployment, it's the version 2, so everything is version. 
I can have metrics for my application. And here you see, for example, uh, the metrics that, are, that I'm using for my application. It takes, uh, takes one or two minutes to start gathering metrics for application, but you assume that. Let's continue on the auto-scaling scenario, right? Because we all love auto-scaling. Auto-scaling is pretty easy. Now that we have defined it a, a limit, so well, let's say my application is consuming at max 250 to 56 mega RAM, and then actually this is configured to run uh, half of a core, if I'm not mistaken. I can actually check how much I'm using right now, resources quota. So my project is using uh, now uh, one, uh, ten, five, five, ten megs of RAM. And in terms of, uh, yeah, so I have the two gigs available. I have five, twelve available. So, run. so let's go to the deployments of my application. And I'm going to set up not auto scaling. Right? As I said, it's pretty easy. I pick, my, I pick up my, uh, my deployment configuration. And I said, add auto scaler. Right. So and this is the moment where I tell the application the minimum and maximum amount of containers or pods that I'm going to have running for my application. So in this application, I'm going to say, and then just uh, before I do that, let me just show you something real quick so they have in mind. So we have two. Let me just bring this back to one, right? So I can show you the auto scaler uh, kicking off, OK? So scaling back to one, it's asking the pod to be terminated. It's going to terminate real soon. So let me go back to my deployments. I'm going to add to the deployment configuration again, add an auto scaler, and I'm going to say that the minimum amount of pods that I have it is two. And remember that I have one, right? So I'm saying that the minimum is two. So I'm going to have a configuration that says the minimum is two. In this case, let's just put the maximum is 10. My CPU target is going to be 50%. So whenever the CPU utilization across all containers reaches a point like 50%, it's going to bring a new container up. If it goes below, uh, and you can specify the thresholds, if it goes below 50%, it will, it will uh, terminate that pod, right? So pretty easy way to do uh, auto-scaling. So I save this, and as you can see, like I have a horizontal pod auto-scaler configured for this application, right? Pretty easy here. Um, it's 2-1. Uh, I can see that I already have metrics for my application. And I have my auto scale saying that the minimum is 2, it's maximum 10. So this takes about, let's say, I think one minute for the auto scaler to start reading those metrics. And we recommend that in production environments, you should pre-warm some applications. So if you know that you're going to have load coming in, let's say, in a weekend, of course, you shouldn't prepare for the whole load, but you should always prepare yourself for more than you currently run. So now that the auto scaler have identified that the minimum is 2, and it's actually spinning up a new container for you to run that application. I didn't have to do anything, right? So this is keeping the resilience, uh, resiliency of the application, right? So another, sure. Just to, but if you have a CPU spike, uh, like an external CPU spike, is, it, is that an aggregated CPU? <laughs> it's aggregated across all pods. So if just one of them is behaving in a strange manner, it's going to consider all pods to do the math whether or not uh, it should auto scale, right? And you can have other types of, uh, of checks on that pod. For example, you can add a health check to that pod that if it becomes unresponsive, you kill it and bring a new one, right? And I'm, I can show you that real quick. So as I said, I can come here to the monitoring of my application just to show uh, my uh, auto scaling. It's, I'm not going to do an auto scaling because auto scaling is like that thing like, all right, it worked, you know? So uh, it's kind of boring when you show. Um, I have to send traffic, but it's okay. You guys believe me, right? This is enterprise software. Um, so this is uh, metrics from my application. It started to collect some metrics from my application. It does CPU memory uh, network, but uh, it also integrates with uh, monitoring tools like Prometheus. I'm sure you've heard of Prometheus to do monitoring of containers. So you can bring a Prometheus uh, monitoring tool to run to monitor your application, right? So now I'm going to, do, to go to a second part of my application, my demo, which is very nice. It's something called the blue-green blue -green, uh, deployments, right? Sorry, A-B deployments. It's when you have on the same route of the application, you have two versions of the application on the same route. So in order for do to, to do this, I'm actually going to need a second version of my application. So I'm going to create a second version of the application. It's going to be a slightly different. So if you remember, this is a welcome to your Node.js and shift grayish background. And I'm going to deploy another version of the application, as I said, slightly modified with a gray background, green background. So I'm going to point you to my personal Git repo here. And this is the green one, just so we know. And all the process is going to kick, kick off again, right? So as I said, it's going to go to your Git repository, as it's, it's doing right down here. It's going to go to your repository, so the build is running. Let's check, take a look at the full logs of the build. So it's going to the Git. It's cloning, it's cloning the repository. Uh, it's pulling an image. So it needs a base image 
to layer your code on top of it, right? And New Red Hat provide images where we maintain the life cycle of those images. So if there's a CVE in any of the dependencies of the image, for example, uh, uh, let's say glibc, that was a, a recent vulnerability, you see that uh, we'll fix that vulnerability for you and you can always be updated. Um, awesome, I very like when this happens. So let me do the build again, try to build. While it does that, let me talk a little bit about the container catalog. So Red Hat was the first company to actually create a health index for, for containers. So with this, we, we, we take containers and we analyze if there has been any vulnerability identified in the containers. So for example, I can take a look here at the Red Hat Atomic Base image, and we can see that uh, this image was updated six hours ago. So six hours ago, we did an update to this image. And as I said, since you're building applications that now are based in containers and contain all the dependencies of your application from the, let's say, the Java dependencies to the operating system dependencies. You, make, you need to make sure that all those dependencies, they are always, the, the, the security vulnerabilities in them are always addressed. So we created this thing called health for, for the for the application. And we, all, we always work uh, to keep those, 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 those images safe, right? So in this image, you see that there was a bug advisory for that image. And if we actually get into the image and see the contents of it, uh, we can see why the image was upgraded and uh, the, the topics that upgraded and the versions that upgraded the image, right? So this is fixing a specific bugzilla, or you can see that a CVE was fixed. Again, keeping you safe all the time, right? Um, let's go back to my, to my application here, the green one. Uh, didn't like the, the build process, so I'm just uh, going to that's the build again for some reason they like this one. I'm just going to create a new one here. So while it does that, I'm going to show you another very cool thing that we have. And I only have eight minutes, but this is very nice. Uh, it's called the concept of health checks. And this is to, for you to add verifications to your application before the container, before OpenShift can do something with it. So we have our very nice Node.js application here. Uh, and I can see that this ha application has no health checks, right? So at some point in time, see, Container.js does not have any health checks. And this is like the, the OpenShift in Kubernetes uses health checks to make sure your application is in a healthy state. Right? For example, you want only to add your application to the router or to the load balancer after it has, fin after it has finished passing a health check. So I want to make sure the application is running before I add it to the router, right? Um, I want to make sure the application is running before I can do a roll in deployment. So these are all the things that you can do. And you can do like pre-start check and also a check that verifies every uh, many seconds. So let's add health checks to this application. And this health check that I'm going to do is a very quick one. I'm going to do a readiness probe. And this will just uh, query a, a, um, a endpoint. And if I get any response from that endpoint, like a 200 OK, for example, uh, that means that my application is running. And this is a readiness probe. So this before OpenShift adds your application to the router, it verifies, are you good to receive requests? And we see people using that, for example, for a cache warm up. So you want to do warm up of your cache, and you add a readiness probe. Right? So let's add a readiness probe. So in this case, I'm just going to do a get on port 8080. Timeout is going to be. Uh, no timeout for this, right? Uh, I'm going to add a, a liveness probe. This is going to verify uh, if it's running, right? The initial delay and the time on it. This is a. All right, so now my application has health checks. So because I changed the configuration of my application, remember, right? When we change configuration, we do a deployment again. Uh, it kicked off a new deployment. So now I have the third version of my deployment of my application running, right? So what happens here, it's, a, it's an interesting case for this. Because before adding to the route, it's actually going to wait a little bit more. So if I didn't have the health checks, it would like see that the container was running and make it addressable right away. Which, if I went to the URL, I could possibly believe not get the complete experience. But now that I added a health check, I, was, I ad only added it to the route once it has passed. So I can just come here and see that my application is running. Right? So I cr the other one that I created for my A-B test is here, which is the green one. So if we come here, 
we'll see that this application has a green background. It's because I want to see blue green. So in order to test this, I'm going to uh, bring an incognito tab. Uh, I'm going to disable cookies here. So cookies are disabled in this browser. So that means that uh, I want to show you AB. So because we have session affinity and you use cookies, I wouldn't be able to show you AB, right? So let's leave this here, right? I'm going to go back to my uh, blue-green deployments. So it's very easy. So I'm going to take the application that I think is the main one, right? And in my case, the JS app is the main one. So I'm going to change the route configuration for the JS application to add another deployment to that same application. So I'm going to add the route configuration. And I'm not changing the deployment or the build. I'm just changing the route configuration. And I'm going to now split traffic for that route across two of the applications. So I chose the green one. And here I'm saying, what is the balance that I want? So normally for A-B deployments, you want to test a feature or a capability. So you, let's say assign 1% of the traffic, 2% of the traffic. Just for the sake of this demo, I'm assigning 50% of the traffic to each, each version of the application. Right? So I'm going to save this. And it like, gives me this very nice graph here showing that I have 50% of traffic going to the green app, 50% of traffic going to the JS app. So this is, again, done at the router level. So the router is already configured to do that. So that means that when I copy this URL in this browser that has it's an incognito tab with no cookies, every time that I open and I'm going to refresh, oops. My cookie thing is not working. Wait. Good. See, every time that I refresh this, I have a different version. So it's the same URL, but I'm sending traffic to different applications. So let's say you want to test a feature, or let's say you have a marketing campaign, or you have something that you want to test, and only in the percentage of application, like with really like a two, three sets of operations, you do that. So, those, so these are the capabilities that I wanted to show. Uh, about OpenShift from you. So I showed, uh, I showed deploying an application, building an application from source code. I, show, I showed uh, uh, scaling uh, using the L3 scaler. I'm show, I showed setting resource limits. I showed health checks. And I showed using AD blip de deployments for OpenShift. Uh, and my time is done. So thanks very much for your, for your, uh, for your presence here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.